Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen. I'm, sorry I'm sorry for this. this. And, and welcome to this conference about dementia, support options, and for people with dementia and their relatives and also uh, professionals. Uh, my name is Sandra Kropa, and I'm very happy to be today here with you and uh, to be moderator of today's conference. And uh, probably, as you know already, that this conference of the Nordic and Baltic countries is organized by the Office of the Nordic Council of Ministers in Latvia in cooperation with the Welfare Department of the Riga City Council. And the goal of this conference is to stimulate, to exchange the experience and discussion between different researchers and professionals and practitioners from the Nordic and Baltic countries. And hopefully that after today's and also tomorrow's uh, sessions, we'll have a lot of experience-based examples that will be shared between different countries and different municipalities. Uh, this is why our program is also so diverse. I would like to say that tomorrow it will be more focused on age-friendly cities and urban environment, but today it will be more focused on dementia prevention and also well-being of people around dementia patients, either their relatives or professionals that work in uh, different sectors. Uh, as you already hear, that uh, working language of today's uh, conference uh, will be English. So if you want to hear me in Latvian, hopefully that you already are using your headphones and you hear me well. But if you are fluent in English, you will need to have headphones later because uh, one presentation will be in Latvian. And also opportunity to ask questions will be in Latvian and English. So feel free to free, uh, use the headphones, hopefully they are with you already and it worked well. So if not, please let us know it. And also if you talk about the questions uh, after each session, there will be opportunity for question and answer session. It is opportunity for people watching us online to ask their questions in uh, slido.com platform. Also here, if you are sitting, you can write your questions in slido.com, but also you can just raise your hand and push the button and switch on the microphone and uh, ask your question directly. Uh, so, I really hope that we'll have a very fruitful day ahead and we will have really a lot of things to talk about here because dementia is something really alarming in the world. If I check the statistics that worldwide uh, there are 55 million people that have dementia already and every year there are nearly 10 million new cases, so it's pretty alarming. It means that we need to think and act about uh, how to prevent dementia and how to help already for people who face, are facing it. And uh, also not to forget about well-being of people who are around uh, dementia patients. So let's share the knowledge, let's share the experience, because this is the way how we can help to improve life of so many people. And that's why I would like to invite here on this stage to open this conference, the Vice Chair, uh, Vice Chair of the Riga City Council, Ms. Linda Wozewell, please come here. And we are really welcoming you with applause here. Good day, glad to see you live in Lugt Rigs Dome. So, to my great surprise, I have to speak in English, actually. Uh, I was not prepared, but I will do so. I'm, on behalf of the Riga City Council, it is really a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here uh, in our uh, working place uh, daily. But we are very happy to open our doors to everybody who takes care of the people living in our city, and thus we can also help everybody in our country. And we're also happy to welcome the partners uh, from Lithuania, Estonia, the ones that I heard, and then from the Nordic countries that are all also very close to my heart. Indeed, um, we are ha actually using this uh, city hall uh, to talk about social care services offered by the Riga city quite regularly. Just a few weeks ago, uh, we also talked about elderly people and taking care of them and the needs that are increasing extremely quickly. And uh, as Sandra mentioned already, uh, I also checked the numbers and came to the conclusion about the 55 uh, million people currently with dementia in the world. So our Department of Welfare uh, has a prognosis that in 2030 it will be 65.7 million uh, in the world uh, people suffering from dementia and in 2050 it will be 115 million 
And of course, no country in this world is an exception uh, and no city is an exception. And also we in Riga have to face uh, this uh, current situation. And we do offer uh, a number of services, uh, both in social care institutions, in daycare centers, uh, at people's uh, uh, home places where they live, uh, also short-term beds uh, to the extent that we can. But nevertheless, we still have quite a number of people uh, queuing up for social care uh, services. And we are not, uh, as a city, as the biggest municipality in Latvia, still we are not uh, able to offer this service to everybody who needs it. Out of those uh, who are queuing up for social care services, approximately half of them uh, have uh, dementia in Riga. Could be the same case for Latvia uh, as a whole. And we are very well aware of the uh, challenges we have to face, of the finances. A lot of that is finances and human resources, two uh, aspects that we have to uh, pay most of our attention. In recent years, if I look back, thanks to um, my colleagues in the City Council, indeed Riga has um, increased uh, really uh, considerably uh, the n amount of money uh, for social care services. It, w it has been around 20% increase uh, in the last uh, two uh, consequent years. We'll see how we'll manage for the next year. Uh, but still, even with this uh, increase, we are not managing uh, to respond to the needs as quickly. And um, I remember, I'm also a member of the Social Affairs Committee in the Riga City Council. And then when our experts uh, report, uh, for example, uh, I remember one uh, meeting uh, on, on dementia issues. And uh, then uh, we were informed about the um, um, signs that can uh, make people think that maybe it is uh, dementia approaching. I think everybody, we were like, Catch, holding our breath and catching to our hearts uh, because we said, maybe I have something of that, uh, considering uh, the speed of our everyday lives and the stress levels that me and everybody here present in the room, I'm 100% sure, goes through on daily basis. So we cannot be sure that we will avoid uh, this point of agenda in our lives. So let's better be supportive uh, to each other and think about it collectively for the, uh, and look for uh, the solutions, the best solutions we can offer to really be able to call ourselves a welfare country that takes care of its citizens. Once again, we are happy to welcome you here uh, in the heart of Riga and also wish you a fruitful day uh, here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda Orzova. And uh, as, uh, I would like to also give a floor to Artyom Urshulskis, Parliamentary Secretary of Ministry of Health of the Republic of Latvia. And Artyom will join us online. So we won't hear him here directly in person. Hopefully we see, yes, already on screen. So the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me apologize that uh, I'm joining you online. Unfortunately, I got some kind of virus infection and uh, today I still need to isolate at home. Don't want to get others in the room sick. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, the Riga City Council, uh, and also the Nordic Council of Ministers Office for uh, getting actually this event done and bringing together a wide range, wide range of experts. And uh, on this actually sunny September day, as you can see from my uh, from my living room to discuss uh, this challenge, which is truly one of the greatest health challenges our society is facing today, which is dementia. Uh, this is a topic that affects not only patients, but also carers, also the families of the patients and our society as a whole. Uh, when we look through the documents provided by the World Health Organization, we can see that their prediction is that the number of people living with dementia 
will increase by around 40% by 2030, which is only six years apart. And in Latvia, the available data we have show the similar trend. And uh, these findings highlight the need for special attention right now to the recognition, to the diagnosis, and also to the treatment of dementia. The challenge is caused by the fact that often dementia is not recognized in time, so people do not get all the help they need. And early recognition and diagnosis of dementia is a pressing issue, definitely. Not only in Latvia, but, only, but also globally, I believe. I should also say that we face, in pro we face the problem that this issue is stigmatized and the stigma discourages people from seeking help. And therefore, one of the tasks for our societies is to reduce the stigma. It is definitely misleading to think that dementia affects only older people. Unfortunately, more and more younger people are being diagnosed with this disease and no one actually can be safe and no one actually can, can be sitting and thinking that this is something which harms only others. So this is why our mission is not only to inform the whole society, but also to educate professionals who care and who provide support and uh, who help people on a daily basis. It is also essential to strengthen intersectoral cooperation and to develop new accessible services. This is definitely not only the story of Ministry of Health or not only the story of Riga City Council or any other city councils in Latvia. This is a story of whole society. Excuse me for a second to have a slide. Yeah, it looks I'm back. Something happened with my internet. So yeah, uh, those accessible services should be uh, provided uh, all uh, parties coming together. Uh, because the, uh, the impact of dementia is not only on our health, it's also, about, it's also on our labor market, also on our economy, and also on our families. And uh, the situation when you are diagnosed with dementia is extremely difficult and tragic for everyone involved. Uh, also for the loved ones. It's not only the deep pain and challenge for the one who is diagnosed. So the necessary support should be on all provided on all uh, levels, not only on medical level, but also on social level. And uh, we actually see the positive steps uh, in Latvia in the area of developing the support opportunities. Uh, we have quite good cooperation with uh, the municipalities and we need to expand that cooperation, but still we have some significant gaps existing today that we need to uh, tackle. For example, uh, currently the family members and carers in Latvia often lack access to structured programs when they can learn the new skills and learn, learn the new knowledge about living with people diagnosed with dementia. And uh, these programs are really important and also important, it is also very important to ensure that professional development and support is available for care workers because their work is becoming more and more structured and uh, they need to know more and they need to face different situations every day. And uh, a lot of emotional psych uh, psychological challenges they face every day. So we need to think about them as well. And uh, at the end, I would like to say thank you again for this platform and for the opportunity to share our view and our experiences and uh, to highlight the uh, necessity of working together to address these challenges. And we truly believe that only with timely action and coordinated approach, we'll be able to significantly improve the quality of life of people diagnosed with dementia and also their families. Thanks a lot and have a fruitful day. Thank you also, uh, Artyom Ursulskis was with us. But uh, I'm very happy to announce that also Reynis Uzulnex is with us here today, a Parliamentary Secretary of Ministry of Welfare of the Republic of Latvia. And also we welcome you as well to uh, share some welcome words with us. 
So please. Cienījumi konferences dalībnieki, dāmas un kungi. Man ir patiešas liels gods un prieks būt šeit, šajā nozīmīgajā Ziemeļa valstu un Baltijas valsts konferencē, kas veltīta atbalsta iespējām cilvēkiem ar demenci un sabiedrībai draudzīgas pilsēt vidas attīstībai. Šīs tēmas ir ārkārtīgi svarīgas ne tikai Latvijā, bet arī globālajā mērogā. Un to nozīme pieaug līdz ar sabiedrības novecošanos, un to saistītiem izaicinājumiem. Cilvēki ar demenci ir viena no visneaizsargātākajām grupām, un viņu ikdienas dzīves kvalitāte lielā mērā ir atkarīga no tā, kādu atbalstu un izpratni viņi saņem no ģimenes locekļiem, apkārtējās vides un sabiedrības. Demence ietekmē ne tikai paši individu. Demence ietekmē arī viņu ģimenes locekļus, viņu tuviniekus, Šī iemesla dēļ ir svarīgi apzināt un pārņemt labo praksi. Un kā jau mans kolēģis minēja, ar vien vairāk jaunu cilvēku sasirgst ar demens, līdz ar to arī darbspējīgie jaunieši nav pasargāti no šīs slimības. Bet atbalsts nodrošinājums cilvēkiem ar demensi nav tikai izaicinājums, bet arī iespēja, kas prasa efektīvu visu ministriju un starp nozaru iesaisti, gan veselības aprūpi, gan arī sociālo aprūpi. Šajā kontekstā mūsu uzdevums ir ne tikai stiprināt esošās sadarbības formas, bet arī meklēt jaunas veidus, efektīvāks risinājums. Tikai mācoties vienam no otru un kopā meklējot risinājums, mēs varam nodrošināt drošāk nākotni cilvēkiem ar demens, gan arī visiem sabiedrības locekļiem. Vienlīdz svarīgi ir veidot arī iekļaujošo pilsētu vidi, kas būtu draudzīgi visām sabiedrības grupām. Iekļaujošu pilsētu vidi ne tikai uzlabo dzīves kvalitāti, bet arī ir izšķiroši senioriem, bērniem, cilvēkiem ar invalitāti, lai uzlabotu mobilitātes problēmas. Universālais dizains – tas vairs nav tikai ērtības jautājums. Tam ir jābūt kā pamattiesībām, kas nodrošina, ka publiskā telpa, pakalpojumi, Transports ir pieejami un izmantojami ikvienam. Mūsu sabiedrībai, novecojot, mums ir jārada tāda vide, kas dod iespēju senioriem ar pārliecību orientēties savā ierastajā vidē. Nodrošonāt piekļūstamību un universālā dizaina ar izsinājums, mēs ne tikai uzlabojam dzīves kvalitāti cilvēkam ar invalitāti un senioriem, bet mēs veitajām visu empātiju pret visu sabiedrību, kur ir atvērta, iekļaujoša, jo no tā ieguvēja būs mēs visi. Protams, mums vienlaiks būs jāmeklē arī inovācijas un arī jāmācās no mūsu Ziemeļu valstu un Baltijas kolēģiem. Viņu labās prakses, viņu piemērus pārņemot un pielāgojot to mūsu situācijai un patstāvīgi pilnveidojot atbalsts sistēmas. Tādēļ noslēgumā es vēlos sirsnīgi pateikties visiem konferences rīkotājiem, Ziemeļu ministru padomas birojiem Latvijā, Rīgas domas lauklaivas departamentam, lektoriem un visiem klātesošiem par jūsu ieguldījumu. Jūsu darbs ir nozīmīgs un es esmu pārliecināts, ka šī konferences kļūst par vērtīgu platformu, pieredzes apmaiņai, jaunām idejām un dažādiem risinājumiem. Vēlu veiksmīgu, produktīvu, iedvesmojošu konferences, produktīvas diskusijas, jaunas idejas, ko jūs varētu pielietot ikdienā, un galvenais veiksmīgu sadarbību, lai mēs turpinātu pilnvētoties, mēs kļūtu stiprāki, un iekļaujošāk sabiedrību. Paldies, lai jums izdevusies dienu. Paldies, Vēnim uz Ulniekam. Thank you. And now, last but not least, I would like to ask here as well Stefan Eriksson, the director of the Nordic Council of Ministers Office in Latvia, to come here as part of the organizers of this conference as well to say a few words, please. Thank you. Paldies. Labdien, good afternoon. Goeftemida, cienājāmā Rīgas domes priekšēdāja vietniece, cienājāmie parlamentāri sekretāri, damas un kungi, kolēģi, ladies and gentlemen, man ir liels gods un prieks jums šodien uzrunāt ar kādiem vārģiem šīs konferences sākumā. Change to English, don't worry. This conference was originally planned 
some time ago, for different reasons, it didn't take place. But on behalf of uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers office in Latvia and all Nordic institutions involved, I want to say that I'm very glad that we are today here, that we are starting this important conference. It is part of a Nordic Baltic cooperation project that brings together senior officials, experts, practitioner, uh, practitioners in the area of social welfare and health. The goal of the project is to support Nordic Baltic dialogue on topics important to our societies through exchanges of experiences, seminars, study visits, and conferences like this one. Uh, three important target areas within the project have been children, people with disabilities and elderly people, uh, but the project has also dealt with other social and health issues of importance and relevance for both the Nordics and the Baltics. This week, a uh, meeting with the, well actually last week, uh, a meeting with senior officials from the Nordic and Baltic countries took place, actually in Vilnius, where a discussion of a possible continuation of this project was discussed. Uh, the topic of today's and tomorrow's conference is dementia, age-friendly friendly cities, as you know. As people tend to live longer lives, the theme of dementia has become increasingly relevant for our societies. Not so long ago, the Swedish presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers organized a conference on dementia in Stockholm, where also Baltic participants were present. It is evident that this theme needs more attention in our society, because it involves more people than we sometimes think, it's important to break the stigma related to this diagnosis, diagnosis, which influences the lives of not only the patients themselves and medical and social caretakers, also relatives and friends, to those who live with dementia are affected. Uh, I can confirm this myself since uh, my mother, 85 years old, since the beginning of this month is living in a group home for elderly people uh, with dementia outside my hometown Westeros in Sweden. Uh, me and my sister, we have lived with this situation for some time um, and, well, as you can imagine, it's not always easy to deal with. Yesterday, my sister called me after having visited our mother and telling me that, well, unfortunately, it wasn't a good day. Uh, it's not possible for our mother to live alone in her house. Still, this is what she wants and we, uh, her children, are blamed for that this is not happening. So we all need more knowledge about how to live with dementia. Uh, and I really look forward to listening to today's conference. And thank you to all our partners for organizing this conference, and in particular Riga City's Welfare uh, Department and my colleagues at our office in Riga. Uh, thank you also to all speakers coming from the Nordics and the Baltics. And thank you for all of you participants that have come here today or are listening to this conference online. Uh, wish you all Two interesting, fruitful days here in Riga. Thank you. Thank you, and also thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, today we'll hear as well experience stories, personal experience stories from family members uh, who are facing this challenging uh, yes, situation with the dementia patients and their families. But um, now let's start our working sessions, and uh, this is the time where I would like to remind about the opportunities to ask questions at the end of the presentations, uh, after, actually at the end of the session, not after each presentation, but at the end of the session. And for those who are watching us online, you can uh, scan the QR code or just uh, type the passcode. Also, if you are sitting here, I would like to ask your questions in slido.com platform. Please dial the 26556117. You probably can see this passcode also on the screen, but just in case you can't see it or you're losing it, the passcode is like this. So let's start our first session. It, it will be about the dementia prevention. And the first presentation will be about dementia prevention and brain health promotion inside from the Nordics. And we will hear this from Pia Nevala Westman from Nordic Welfare Center. Uh, Pia is senior advisor at the Nordic Welfare Center and she joined it in 2021, focusing on public health and older adults. So I think all the rest you can tell us on your own. And please, the microphone is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the organizers, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak on this important topic of dementia prevention here today at the conference. My name is Pia Nevala Westman, and I'm a senior advisor on public health at the Nordic Welfare Center. I'm also coordinating the Nordic Dementia Network that I will tell you a little more about. Uh, before I get to the topic of dementia prevention, I will just briefly present a Nordic, the Nordic Welfare uh, Center as an institution for you that are not acquainted uh, uh, with the uh, institution. Uh, we are an institution under uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers, and we have offices in Sweden and Finland. I come from the Finnish uh, office, and with me I also have a colleague, Louise Schell Thomasen, who is sitting there, and she's from uh, the Stockholm office. Uh, we receive our assignments from the Nordic Council of Ministers for Health and Social Affairs. So they actually decide what we are going to do. So our mission uh, is to uh, facilitate uh, Nordic networks, enhance cooperation with the Baltic countries, as we just heard, and to contribute to development of welfare initiatives in the Nordic region by compiling and sharing knowledge. So, um, compiling knowledge, well, what is that about? Because we are not a research institution. Well, there is a lot of practices, policies, experiences in the different Nordic countries and uh, Greenland, the Faroe Islands and Åland Islands, and also the Baltics that can be shared with, with each other. Uh, on welfare issues. So, uh, one of the assignments uh, that we received to uh, do a report on policy and mapping all the initiatives in the Nordics uh, was on dementia prevention uh, that we received in uh, 2023. We also received uh, an assignment to organize the big conference in Stockholm on dementia prevention. And why was this? Well, you have already heard uh, in the opening uh, presentations that uh, dementia presents a major challenge to individuals and to the society. Uh, it's a tragedy for the individuals it's a tragedy for uh, the relatives, uh, but it, it's also a big, big societal challenge to offer these persons a good uh, dementia care, good life quality and a good life, even with dementia. So, where are we standing? Well, uh, it's estimated uh, that the number of people with dementia will double up to, to uh, 2050 uh, and effective treatment is still lacking. The good news is that we now have evidence on that health enhancing environmental factors and healthy lifestyle can contribute to more life years uh, with good cognitive function. So actually, today, 2024, we know that almost half of the dementia cases uh, can be prevented. And that is mainly by delaying the onset of dementia. So, how have the Nordic countries responded to the potential of dementia prevention? Well, this was uh, 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 the question, the curious question when uh, we received uh, the assignment on writing this report. 
So now we have a compilation, and this might be the most important thing about this uh, presentation. If I don't get to the end, you know that everything that I will say is in, in the report. Uh, I have a few physical copies with me, but you can download uh, this uh, report free from our website, and you can reach it with the QR code uh, that you see there. So, this report has now mapped practices and policies in the Nordics on dementia prevention. So, it's a very good material to use as an inspiration. But I would also like to mention that we actually had with us uh, an Baltic expert group in the beginning of January who has also uh, contributed to this uh, report. So they have very much uh, encouraged, um, especially uh, the, the life um, uh, course perspective on dementia prevention because this is nothing that is only done when you are an aging ad adult. It's something that should be done from the beginning of the life course. So this goes very much hand in hand with other public health initiatives that we will see. But let's go to the basics. How does the research and evidence uh, look on dementia prevention? Well, this is quite a new area of research. It's only like 15 years ago when uh, the researchers uh, saw that uh, there was a falling incidence on dementia in the world and they wanted to know what factors are influencing this falling incidence. Now, we hear that uh, dementia will double, but that's because of the aging population. That's because of the demographics, but the incidence is falling, at least in some areas in, in the world. So they started to look into what factors are protective. And um, I think that this is quite a fast, um, a uh, trip that has become from, from the first research to actually that we already have policy and practice in place. That's not always that it happens so, so fast. But maybe this is also because this is really uh, uh, something hopeful that you can use prevention. We still don't have the effective treatment, but we, we have the results on prevention. Okay, so 2015, uh, there was a F uh, Finnish study uh, uh, that is called FINGER, uh, the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study on uh, uh, Cognitive Decline and uh, Disability, um, that showed that a two-year intervention for risk groups in the age span of 60 to 77 years of age showed a major uh, um, impact uh, with better cognition, memory, and so on. So that was really a groundbreaking study. And then 2017, uh, the, Lancet Com the Standing Lancet Commission uh, on prevention uh, care uh, on, and on dementia uh, gave their first uh, review article in Lancet where they compiled the evidence of uh, prevention, with, then with nine risk factors. In 2019, there was already guidelines from the WHO um, on prevention. And we will look into first finger, uh, the finger model uh, consists of a multi-model um, intervention with five intervention areas. And then you can remember it's five fingers on the hand. 
it's healthy food, it's physical activity, it's mental stimulation, social activities, and then uh, monitoring uh, your cardiovascular values like uh, cholesterol and blood pressure. Uh, the intervention group got this intervention uh, in, for two years and there was a really low dropout rate. And this is important because this tells you that this model can also easily be adapted in real life. So this model has become very popular around the world. And um, of course, there are forerunners. So Finland uh, is a forerunner. Um, and I will tell you more about that as well. But also in Sweden, I think that we have 80 co uh, municipalities that are now working or are interested in the finger model because it's no big deal. And also, if you look at this, well, then you will see that th this also um, affects uh, social isolation. So a lot of these things you can do together. So that's also something very good. And you can also do it at home, even if, even if you still uh, live uh, home. Uh, well, what was the result? Well, the cognitive benefits, 20% lower risk for car cardiovascular events. This is also important because this means that if you are preventing dementia, then you will also prevent cardiovascular events because what is good for the heart is also good for the brain. That's really good to remember. So that means that you're, if you already have some heart-promotive uh, uh, policies or practices in place, then you can also like uh, use that for dementia prevention. 30% lower risk for functional decline. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, you can function longer in, in your daily activities at your home and so on. Uh, so that's also very, very important. And 60% lower risk for chronic diseases. Okay, then there we are again. This also is a preventive measures for other non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Reduced uh, costs for health care, better health-related quality of life, and health economic benefits. So that about finger. And WHO uh, defined that we need to do everything we can to, to reduce our risk of dementia. The scientific evidence gathered for these guidelines confirms what we have suspected for some time. What is good for our heart is also good for our brain. Since uh, 2017, the Lancet Commission has uh, published two more um, review articles and the latest came late July this year. So if there was nine risk factors that were modifiable 2017 and 12 in 2020, it's now 14 uh, modifiable risk factors. We all have risk factors that are not modifiable. It's age, it's gender, it's bad genetics. Those we can't change, not yet anyway. But then there is these 14 modifiable risk factors that, that we can amend. And that's really good because those sum up to those 45% prevention potential. There are some things that it is not so easy to do as an individual. Uh, it's not easy to uh, get good education if you don't have a good educational system in your country that is available and equal uh, for everyone. And it's not easy uh, to change 
the quality of air, air pollution. There we need to have policies in place that is really done uh, broadly. And maybe we are on our way to that with the green transition. I don't know that the air pollution will, will lessen. But then we have uh, 12 other risk factors that we actually can um, modify also on an individual level. It's like high LDL, it's um, uh, high blood pressure, obesity, physical inactivity, uh, tobacco use, um, and high alcohol con consumption. And then there is uh, risk factors that we need uh, to get help from the healthcare and also identify like hearing loss and vision loss and, and so on. So it's a mix of things that you can do on the individual level and uh, what you can do uh, on really an, uh, a policy level. But if you look at this uh, figure, you also see that most things you need to do in midlife. So promoting health and changing your lifestyle uh, during midlife uh, is really the most important thing. But still, you can still do a lot also during a late life, uh, which finger, uh, the finger study actually shows. Um, yeah. So uh, then we have another saying here. It's never too early nor too late in the life course for dementia prevention. Hmm. Good to remember. Prevention of dementia can uh, be offered in different levels. It's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. And tertiary prevention uh, is when you already have the diagnosis, uh, MCI or uh, dementia. Uh, and primary prevention is what you do broadly uh, in, in uh, the population and also on the individual level when you're still uh, uh, without, uh, when you're still healthy. And then there is a secondary prevention where you might have like obesity or diabetes and uh, you need to promote all the good factors uh, in, in that segment. So, uh, now some examples from, uh, from our report. Uh, public health policy. Well, uh, to say uh, none of the Nordic countries has used the evidence to set up a systematic dementia prevention strategy as a part of an NCD or pub public health strategy in all life course perspective. Well, that's really a, a big chunk, but no one has done that yet. Um, but if we look at uh, the forerunners, we have Iceland and Finland that has been working with dementia prevention uh, for some time. Iceland's dementia plan from 2020 explicitly mentions prevention as a focus area. And Finland has a, for a long time worked systematically with the finger model, focusing on the older adults. This work has been assigned by the Finnish government. But then we also have Sweden, uh, because the Swedish Board of Health and Welfare uh, got an assignment uh, from um, uh, the Swedish government uh, to compile an, a knowledge, uh, to compile knowledge to prepare for a renewed dementia strategy in, in 2025. And here, prevention is one of the new focus areas. So Sweden is just a bit behind, but <laughs> Finland and Iceland are the forerunners. And then I would also like to mention legislation and regulation that we have been quite successful in the Nordics with the legislation and regulation, for instance, on um, uh, alcohol and drinking and the regulation of tobacco and smoking. Uh, and here it has been very inspiring to hear uh, the Latvian um, um, inc incitament to, to uh, also regulate uh, tobacco and smoking. So, an implementation of practice. Uh, recommendation in the report, easy to make healthy choices for all, a bit of nudging, 
uh, promoting brain health and supporting cognitive functionality during the whole lifespan. And then we also uh, recognized four key barriers, opportunities, and I have just highlighted two of them here. Lack of knowledge in the public and challenges reaching out to health information to vulnerable, vulnerable subgroups. So, uh, there is a low awareness in the public uh, about dementia prevention. So this is one of the first things we have to do, raise awareness in the public. And this can be done by awareness campaigns, public health guidelines, information, and lifestyle counseling, for instance, uh, on the national or the local level, and different actors and sectors involved. And here you have just some examples of, um, from, from the Nordics. Uh, maybe I should highlight something here. I think I will highlight the finger ABC, that it's a newly uh, launched digital uh, learning platform uh, that is open for everyone, so where you can go in and, and learn more about uh, the risk factors that you can um, amend. And I would also like to, to uh, highlight uh, about vulnerable groups that there is one group that has uh, a high risk of dementia on onset in early ages, and that is people with intellectual disabilities and mainly uh, Morbus Down. So more recognition on this group if they are to receive optimal health promotive measures and care during the life course. So this is practice. Promoting healthy lifestyle like good education, physical activity, healthy food and social inclusion is important for people with ID and should not be forgotten. Awareness and practice. And need of a comprehensive preventive and health promotive strategy for this vulnerable subgroup policy. In practice, this means that everyone should have the opportunity to eat healthy food, to be physical activity, to meet their own learning potential, um, and so on. And we actually have a sub-network in the dementia network that is working with dementia and intellectual disabilities. And um, uh, we did a webinar um, in autumn 2023 about uh, the possibilities of dementia prevention in this group. Unfortunately, this is only in different Nordic languages. But if you can, <laughs> uh, if you know uh, Swedish, Norwegian or Danish, then you can uh, take part of this webinar because it's on our website. I would also like to uh, thank um, our uh, partner in this uh, report. Um, this was conducted in close cooperation with the Norwegian National Center for Aging and Health and the Nordic Welfare Center. And the mapping and writing uh, was undertaken by senior researcher uh, Grete Schelvik at the Norwegian National Center for Aging and Health. And there we also have this uh, Nordic Baltic Roundtable meeting uh, I would like to uh, address. Thanks to uh, Daina, uh, Madara Saka in Latvia, and Piret Pordelo Tomingas, who is sitting here today, and Marius Sirionis in Lithuania, who uh, very much uh, contributed to the discussions that then became working material for uh, this uh, report. And then uh, I have 30 seconds uh, left. Uh, we held this uh, conference in Stockholm um, in the beginning of September. And I would just like to highlight that there will be an edited version of the online conference soon to be published on YouTube. So you can all uh, watch the uh, presentations. 
And we will also launch or uh, publish a digital conference report uh, on our website as well, and that will be soon. So if you want more inspiration, then please uh, uh, take part uh, in those as well. Okay, and how do we succeed? I think that the holy grail is evidence, policy, practice, and that leads to good implementation. All aboard, the key to success is in dementia prevention is that everyone is rowing in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you, Pia, for your very interesting presentation and hopefully also inspiration to work together. And uh, as you already mentioned, that the public awareness is very low about this, but it's so interesting that it's all basic things what we hear around, also from cardiologists, do this, do this, do this, and it's the same also for dementia prevention. So probably there's interesting point of discussion as well later in the question and answer session. So you mentioned that the Finland is also a good example. Uh, with the Finnish example, we also continue our program. And the next presentation will be uh, from Pia Pukinen, Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. And Pia will tell us about the national memory care pathway to support people with dementia and memory impairment. Uh, Pia, where are ah, you? are here, so please come here and probably as well you can tell us more about what you would like to also say about yourself and your presentation. So, thank, thank you, you very much. Dear colleagues, dear participants, thank you very much for inviting me to tell about our memory care pathway in Finland. Um, I work uh, in the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. I'm a specialist there, and we have this project for um, creating a pilot model for the memory services uh, for two and a half years, and it just finished last year, end of last year. Just as a background, I'd like to tell you that um, we are a population of about 5.6 million. And the age group that is growing fastest is that of persons aged 85 or over. We are also one of the most rapidly aging populations in Europe. And um, we earlier heard about the figures of uh, worldwide um, dementia cases, but in Finland, we diagnose approximately 23,000 uh, diagnoses every year. Um, the incidence rate has remained rather stable since 2016, but with the age group of 85 or over aging most rapidly, it means that we expect to have a 64% increase in dementia cases by the year 2040. So the last government by Sanna Marin, um, they had a national program on aging until the year 2030. And they had key impact objectives of which one was older people are maintaining good functional capacity for a longer time. And under that objective, we had funding for creating this national memory care pathway. Uh, the goal was to create a national pilot model for memory services and to include the multi-domain lifestyle counseling intervention, which Pia Nevala Mestman earlier mentioned, called FINGER, and, and that is specially targeted to persons with increased risk for memory decline, and also to implement the objectives of the national program on aging. Uh, the aim was uh, to create a person-centered care pathway where risks and problems are identified early on and support and services are provided timely. Seamless service chain meant that the person with cognitive decline does not drop out at any point from the service system. And the information flow between professionals is smooth. Uh, there are also fo follow-up protocols that monitor the changes um, 
and the changes in the person's states and service needs. With appropriate services and early diagnosis, we hope that it is possible to maintain the quality of life and minimize the burden also for informal carers. And with the lifestyle counseling, we hope to postpone the transition from living at home to 24-7 um, residence services for a later, later in life. In this uh, figure, you can see basically the five stages of the memory care pathway. Um, the process included uh, promotion of brain health and lifestyle counseling in the form of finger model. And as Pia earlier said, it is a life course thing. <laughs> we can start it uh, even before there are any problems with memory, but we can also continue until the end of life. Uh, then the second stage is sort of identification of memory decline and the problems. Then we follow to assessment, which often takes place in primary health care. Then in the heart of the system, there is a geriatric knowledge center or memory clinic, whatever you want to call it. And it's an outpatient clinic where the multi-professional team is, and they do the diagnosis, decisions of care, and so forth. And of course, after that, we need to follow up, provide care and services. And I'm going to go through all these stages once again. Um, promotion of brain health starts with identification of risk groups and provision of lifestyle counseling at all stages of uh, care pathway. It also needs to be seen in the strategies of the municipalities and um, other areas, uh, all the sectors, so that it is actually appreciated. I won't go more deeply into that now because Pia already said that there is information available about that. But um, we hope that with this uh, finger model we can either prevent uh, dementia cases or slow down the progression and maintain the quality of life of those persons who have this disorder and their near ones. Identification. Um, we can encounter persons with memory decline anywhere in the society. Um, the first contact that these people come to could be um, health and social services, it could be shops, uh, anywhere, a pharmacies. But in Finland, we also have client counseling where they can contact and get assessment done. Uh, it's also possible that they contact the primary health care, which is usually also the first place when uh, problems arise. But the main thing uh, with this pathway that we created was to focus at easy access to memory care services. Um, we realize that there needs to be multi-channel co contact possibilities, phone, e-contact, low threshold meeting places. Um, it should be a very simple process to get to the assessment and without referral. That is what was emphasized, that if we need a referral, that takes a lot of time to get to the services. And um, also, we need skills, we need knowledge and resources in all parts of the, not only healthcare system, also in the uh, social services, and hopefully also uh, in main population. More and more people should be aware uh, of these problems. And in order for all of us to be able to inform about the worry of somebody else's memory, or our own memory, we could, for example, make a worry notification. Uh, there are systems that we can contact social workers or client counseling and ask for help. And even if I'm telling this, it doesn't not always work like that yet. <laughs> but uh, this is the aim that we have kind of found out and created. Then assessment. Mm. 
the first assessment can take place in primary health care, and that is uh, where there should be uh, memory nurses or nurses who are qualified to do the memory assessment. But it can also be uh, in client counseling or sometimes, uh, depending on the system in the regions, uh, people might go directly to the geriatric knowledge centers. But um, what is important is that these persons who are assessing the memory can actually recognize that they have enough tools and enough competence to recognize the memory problems. And also, um, they need to have agreed consultation routes and referral practices so that these persons can actually be directed to the geriatric knowledge centers. Um, for example, it's important there are standard referrals uh, so that all the lab tests and other tests needed beforehand are available when the person enters the uh, geriatric services. Um, the information flow uh, needs to be smooth and that signifies that um, all the data that concerns that person should follow him or her. Um, there could be um, data systems, um, of course, with data security, but also so that um, the person doesn't need to be always telling what is the background, what happened, why am I here? But there could be as much, uh, as much information available as possible. And it's also important that there is a contact person so that whenever you have a question, what next, where should I contact, what should I do, why am I like this, um, you could contact a person. It could be in different places. It could be in primary health care or in client counseling or in geriatric knowledge center. But it is important that the person or the carers, relatives, they always know where to contact. And of course, we have national care guidelines that should be followed. Then at the heart of this whole thing is uh, the geriatric knowledge center. And of course, people can come to there uh, from different parts and people can sort of mingle between different stages um, at times. But geriatric knowledge center is the place where they actually define the diagnosis, start a medication and treatment. And they should also follow up the person so that, um, for example, after three months, when the medication is sort of stabilized, um, then they can say that, okay, now you can uh, go to the primary health care and they can follow up your case. Um, therefore, um, we need a multi-professional team there. And for some countries that might be neurology uh, depends on the system. And especially in Finland, those who are affected at the working age, they will go to neurology usually because their diagnoses are different and symptoms are different. It's more difficult to define and it may take even longer. It depends on what is the best. Um, and we also suggest that if a progressive memory disorder is not uh, diagnosed, there should sit, still be some sort of uh, follow-up, maybe 12 months um, after the first visit, because it could be that there is something underlying. Of course, depends on the case, but so that there is always support available if needed. And what is also important for the well-being of a person with dementia and their carers is that the there is also in the geriatric knowledge center a person who you can contact and who is uh, cooperating closely with these people so that we can provide the services and support best that we can and, and support the quality of life those people. Then when the medication is uh, stable, oh, what happened? table <laughs> lies. Um, there is the follow-up and care and services. And um, I've circulated primary health care and that is where usually that happens, where people go if they've got any problems after that. 
Of course, they can always go back to the geriatric knowledge center if, if it re is required. And also home care client or 24 seven client, they also get information from the primary health care. But the thing is that there needs to be multidisciplinary and multisectoral sectoral cooperation as earlier mentioned also in the, uh, uh, par uh, with the parliamentary secretary's uh, speech. It requires a lot of cooperation and also uh, not only with the uh, healthcare professionals, social care professionals, but as well associations and organizations that can provide support. And um, defined responsibilities are important um, so that also the interfaces between different services are smooth. Accurate pra pra practices as well and um, coordinated patient information systems are important. Of course, we need resources. It requires money and it requires knowledge, training, etc. And it's important that there is always somebody somewhere who kind of follows with the person, a contact person that sees that um, when there is a visit, the person comes to the visit and we never leave sort of alone that person or the carers so that there is always support available. Well, we didn't do this alone in our institute. We had a large network. Uh, we cooperated and co-developed this pathway in a network of professionals, directors in social and healthcare services, institutions, non-governmental organizations, experts of experience, carers and, and people with dementia. Also, educational institutions were involved and finger researchers. We had a lot of different kind of activities, uh, meetings, webinars, workshops, and we went through the whole pathway from the beginning, stage by stage, and we asked um, the opinions, um, feedback on what is good and what should be done, what could work better. Uh, we organized surveys, we did literature reviews and excursions to the areas because all the systems in different well-being counties work a little bit differently. We didn't want it to be a one model fits for all. We wanted to create a generic model that could be modified. The terms could be slightly different, different in different areas. But the thing is that it's important in, that in one big entity, like in a well-being services county, everybody's working towards the same goal and knows the practices and um, what is needed at every stage. So what I would like to take on messages for you, um, we tried to de uh, describe a generic pathway with all stages, all professional groups included, all sectors included. We listened to the experts of experience. We gathered good practices, also caveats maybe. Um, we wanted to create a seamless care pathway with the information flow uh, following the person all the way through. And of course, we emphasized the early identification by lifestyle counseling. Uh, knowledge base is important. Also the different kind of tools to contact, to inform about somebody or your own uh, worry of your memory. And there is always a person who follows your case. But the story doesn't end here. As also Pia said earlier, uh, our current government is supporting um, health promotion. Uh, they are providing funding for one to three year projects, of which one is to implement the memory care pathway, and especially concerning uh, the elements of it that concern early identification of risk groups and provision of lifestyle counseling. Uh, of course, we emphasize the finger model, but there could be other types as well available. 
Uh, they also provide funding for group activities, especially for people with dementia, but it also could be for risk groups. Um, there could be projects on cultural activities and also support for informal carers to support their well-being. And we hope that with these projects, um, we will be able to either prevent or um, postpone problems later on. And um, we don't want to forget the uh, carers either. So it is important that because um, social and health sector does not always have enough resources that the support is given to the uh, carers as well. And you will later on today hear one more presentation, one example of those, uh, what could be done by Laura Krautiainen here. I thank you for you all and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pia, for your presentation and sharing your examples. Hopefully, questions will come a bit later as well for you. But our next example will be from Estonia. There will be shared Estonian experience and support system for people with dementia. And we will hear it from Piret Burdelo Tomingas. I hopefully pronounce it more or less correct. Head of Estonian Competence Center for Dementia. Please come already here and while you probably open your presentation, I can introduce you <laughs> to the audience. So Piret Burdelo, how I already said, uh, is yes, head of the head of the competence center and you studied social work and nursing in Norway and have yes. your experience right so you'll share as well your background and uh, your presentation with us thank you thank you so I bring you warm greetings uh, from Estonia my name as mentioned is uh, Piret Burdela Domingas and I'm the manager of um, uh, the Dementia Competence Center that we have. I will tell you a little bit about our experience. And um, I'm actually very happy and very grateful that I have something to tell you. <laughs> that we have some experiences in the recent years. So as many other countries, Estonia is also uh, facing an aging population and a rapidly increasing number of people with dementia. With small but still uh, steady steps, um, we are trying to improve the various ways to support the everyday coping of these people and also their uh, informal caregivers, their loved ones, their families. To do so, we also uh, use funds from uh, the European Structural Funds. Our national welfare principle is to support people so that they can live at home for as long as it is possible. I think one of the biggest developments in Estonia in the recent years has been the establishment of our Dementia Competence Centre. The Competence Centre works on a national level. We will now be six years old uh, in December. Um, we have four full-time employees. Um, our vision and mission actually is to improve the coping and quality of life of people with dementia and also their loved ones, as well as the quality of health and care services and access to these services. So it's a quite broad um, mission that we have. So how do we work? What do we actually do? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so 
one thing that we started right away was the information hotline. At first, it was called information hotline, but we rather quickly saw that it also needs to include the word, tr word trust in there uh, because um, everybody can call. This hotline is open every workday. Uh, the whole day, so it's meant for everybody, for the family members, for people who are starting to have doubts about their own health and memory. Sometimes also they do call, but also for different professionals. Uh, so what we saw quickly was the need to just talk to someone to just share your frustration. So there are calls that are just a few minutes long and really it's some basic information that they need, but some calls turn out to be very long, uh, hours even. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has really proved to be a very effective way of like being of assistance to the general public. But then what we find is that some families need more time. Just a phone call is not enough. Um, they might even need a mediator for the family, different family members who have different understanding of uh, the dementia uh, patient. They, some do and some don't understand the situation, especially the ones who don't live together with the dementia patient. Uh, so it has also um, been our experience that we have shown up as mediators to actually gather around the same table and, and try to explain what is, what is going on and what is the progress going to look like. So they need to start planning ahead. Um, yeah, so this is the individual counseling part. Uh, it's often support and practical advice. What is important is that we are financed by the Ministry of Social Affairs, so everything that we do is free of charge uh, for the families, for the professionals. Uh, we also work anonymously and, um, and we are not um, there to check anybody. Uh, main topics of concern, just maybe um, interesting to mention, uh, why do they call us? Why do they need our um, support and help? What are, the, what are the main things? Problems with care, understanding the person, understanding the behavior, uh, understanding the communication. Uh, often in, in families there are already some quarrels happening, there is high tension, they don't understand what is going on, why is the person changing, why is he behaving differently. Uh, there are questions about do we really need the diagnosis, is it really necessary and sometimes uh, there are problems with the primary care um, uh, family doctors who don't show enough interest in diagnosing uh, dementia and speaking about the care pathway. Sometimes what we see is that the pathway starts with the family doctor and also ends with the family doctor because uh, not everybody gets any referral anywhere. But Still, we are seeing progress there also. Uh, when is the right time for a care home? When can I make this decision? Very important question. A lot of people call and ask that. How long can we keep this going and what is the future going to uh, look like? Also, home adaptations. How can we make the family environment more suitable, more safe for, for our uh, family member. 
uh, mental health issues of family caregivers, the burnout, the emotional burnout. Many say that, okay, the, the physical and, and the care load I can manage, but the emotional part, this is slowly killing me. Uh, I don't know how much longer I can do this. Uh, and also a lot of practical questions. What are the home care services? Are there any daycare services? And, and, and these, of course, are different from local government to local government. And juridical questions also, like um, how guardianship questions and, and so on. So these are the main, main things. In addition to that, we also work towards institutions and, and local governments as experts. They can turn to us for expert uh, counseling. What does that mean? For example, if we take a care home, um, all care homes have people with dementia. Maybe even 70% of uh, the clients have one um, type or some phase of dementia. Uh, so what we aim uh, to achieve is that the care homes actually invite us as experts to their workplaces, to the care homes. We spend um, hours, maybe a whole day there, and, and usually there are cases uh, that are difficult. Difficult behavior, uh, difficult communication, and they are frustrated, they don't know what to do, there is not enough personnel, and, and sometimes the first thought is that we are not qualified. Uh, this person needs to be somewhere else, but where? <laughs> so to prevent that from happening, uh, for the care home not to have the first thought that, okay, this is not the right client for us. Please, we tell them, please invite us, let's try and, and find a solution. Um, in, in care situations, often it can be something with washing, it can be some um, aggressive response to something and, and um, uh, yeah more difficult cases. So this is um, something that is our goal to do more and more next year. Um, uh, we need the care homes to understand that we are not coming to their uh, workplace as um, um, people to check on them, but we are actually there to help them. Yeah. So uh, also good progress there. It takes time. Uh, for them to also um, uh, begin to trust uh, that there is help to get without uh, any uh, criticism. Mm. And we have a lot of specialists that uh, don't work for us full time, but we, we can use them. Uh, a doctor, nurse, uh, occupational therapist, also a soul care worker. Uh, a grief counselor, a lawyer, and we can use all these people both for families and also for institutions. So, and the main topics in uh, the expert counseling area are very, very often uh, behavioral problems, aggression, restlessness, um, Refusal to wash, very, very typical issue. Uh, evaluation of the client's health and coping skills. Some more theoretical knowledge and skills that they feel that they are lacking. Support to the staff. Uh, sometimes they also just need to to tell someone who comes from the outside. Uh, what they feel and how they feel. And um, the recent um, months, more and more, um, 
a wish to make environment adaptations because there are so many people with dementia in care homes, they want more and more to adapt and make the changes in the environment to make it more safe and, and more suitable. And uh, yeah, lately, quite a lot of referrals to us related to so-called uh, like sexual behavior. This is what um, um, we are told, but what we find when we go to the care home and really spend time there, that usually it's not uh, sexual behavior. It is some, for the most part, um, lack of um, closeness, intimacy with someone, uh, lack of touch, but it's not, for the most part, it has nothing to do with sexual behavior. It is just uh, being a person and being very much alone. Yeah. Uh, we organize support groups uh, for um, uh, loved ones, for family members, this is already uh, seventh year that we have had these um, uh, support groups. They are self-help groups. Uh, the point of them being is that every family member there is an expert. They, they know what it means and they can help each other much better than we can help them. So, of course, every, every group has um, someone to lead the discussion and actually we have uh, uh, volunteers doing that, around 50 to 60 volunteers. Mostly they are professionals, but some are also uh, family members themselves. Um, Altogether, Estonia is quite a small country, uh, but we have today 34 different uh, support groups, so we have basically covered the whole country. Uh, and uh, the, the COVID period, of course, was difficult also here, and we started online. Uh, online support groups. And actually the COVID thing ended, but we continued with online uh, groups because they showed to be very successful. And one of the reasons for that being that uh, uh, not all family members can leave their houses. They just can't leave uh, the people, uh, the family member with dementia. So the, the online support group works very well. And we have that both in Estonian language, in Russian, and also in English, because we have, uh, we are starting to have different nationalities in our country also. So yeah, uh, quite a wide range. And the numbers for last year, it was 131 support group meetings, actually. It's 34 groups, but 131 meetings all over the country. Um, this year, the numbers will be bigger, even bigger, uh, but um, 514 participants altogether and uh, 258 for the first time. So... Um, it is developing and, and people are getting more and more knowledge of it. And um, uh, maybe there has been some skeptical thoughts also that the Estonian people are quite reserved and maybe not so open about their family issues and their personal lives, then I disagree. <laughs> uh, no one has asked them and no one has given them the platform to actually safely talk about their situations. And when you give them the platform and they feel safe, they, they share, yeah, and they come. So sometimes we have just... Um, uh, believed something about ourselves that maybe isn't true. <laughs> and and it's, uh, it's not uh, for everybody anyway, but uh, many, many use that. 
last year we uh, developed a new website, Dementus, it means dementia. Um, it is in Estonian and partly also in, in Russian. Um, it has a lot of practical information, a lot of theoretical information, so uh, and all the changes and the equipment that you can use, adaptation equipment and, and a lot of stuff. Uh, what we are specifically proud of uh, is the interactive map. Uh, the rainbows are all the locations where we have the support group. So you go to the website, you know where you live, and then you just check where is the closest uh, support group to you. You click on the umbrella and then you get uh, the practical information about that specific uh, support group, who is leading that, when is the next time the group is meeting, and yes, where and what and when and, and so on. And also a calendar um, with everything that is happening. Uh, the coffee mug is a memory cafe. <laughs> uh, in addition, we work out and, and print a lot of materials, a lot of like handouts that can be used uh, by professionals and, and given to family members. This is the cognitive disorder, dementia. Uh, actually, there is also a possibility to print them out from our web page. But we, we produce uh, different handouts uh, all the time, both in Estonian and also uh, the Russian language. Uh, here are some photos of our memory cafes. These are like meeting places for people uh, with dementia. Uh, and mostly they are people who still live at home. Yeah. So they can come and do something fun together with their loved ones, uh, family members. Um, as you can see here, sometimes they are visited by some dogs <laughs> uh, and, and they can do a lot of artwork or do some gardening together. There are outside, inside activities. So this uh, has really gone very well this year. We have in, in four different locations uh, and um, and the people change. Now we have done it in one location for uh, three years and we see that uh, the people with dementia who have participated, they are starting to get more sick. So some fall out and new ones come. So, uh, But the family members also are very appreciative of this because they don't know what to do and, and they are supported in, in doing something and having meaningful experiences together. Uh, actually, we also have three museums who now have good programs for uh, me people with memory loss, also for the families and uh, people with dementia, for them together. Uh, we, this Dementia Friends movement, it's, it originated in England, but uh, we have... Um, uh, we have bought it <laughs> and, uh, and are also a part of that. So this is more of a, mm, a way of educating the public. It, it means you become a dementia friend, uh, one and a half hours of um, uh, lecture, and you get some basic knowledge. So... Um, at the moment, we are not so many, 342, uh, but still, um, even, even some workplaces invite us. So we want to become dementia friends. Please come and tell us what, what is that and uh, just to become more aware what is it and how to, um, how to notice uh, the symptoms. 
We organize seminars, trainings, conferences, so uh, a lot of that we do as well. Um, but some other things, uh, from um, 2018, our Health Development Institute has organized trainings on dementia for welfare institutions, care homes. It means that um, uh, it's 12 days of training and all the participants, they become uh, internal trainers in their own uh, institutions. They become like experts on dementia in their own care home. This is, this is the main uh, aim. And as you see, a lot of, of healthcare institutions have already participated, 86 and almost 200 employees. As a competence center, we, in addition to the training, we also uh, give them mentorship so that they can start implementing all the theory that they have learned, that they start implementing and putting it into practice in the best possible way. Um, this is a new website for informal caregivers. We see every day that uh, the family caregivers are very overwhelmed. Many operate on the verge of a burnout and they need better access to information, uh, greater support to cope with the burden of, of care. And, and this website gives them a lot of information, materials, videos, podcasts, also real-time support and, and so on. And networking, very important as well. Uh, in 2023, uh, a new care reform entered into force in Estonia and it changed uh, the financing of the a general care service, it means a place in a care home, a nursing home. Now local governments participate. Uh, previously, it was the responsibility of the family. So this is now a major change for the Estonian informal caregiver, a much less uh, financial burden. And uh, the care reform also highlights more clearly the importance of the involvement of loved ones and providing them with good information and the importance of meaningful daily activities. Uh, there is also a comprehensive plan uh, happening right now. It's like uh, in, in works to increase the innovation capacity of the social sector and, and speed up the in introduction of technology. Uh, one of the most important goals for Estonia now is the integration of the healthcare and social sectors because people with dementia especially, they need for these two systems to cooperate very well so that they get the best from both uh, parts. And oh, I, I see that I have no, no more time. So <laughs> there is also a project going on on the development of geriatric and palliative care. And uh, last but not least, we have an NGO, Life with Dementia. They are advocating for people with dementia and their loved ones. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Piret, for your presentation about support services for families. We will talk also after the coffee break at the second part of today's conference. Now is the time for questions and answers. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask for questions here in the audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question and then just switch on your microphone. And of course, it will be perfect if you could indicate to whom you ask the question. Otherwise, anyway, I think we are all here. We'll sort it out easily and you're all Mm, very welcome to come up with comments anyway. Please, do we have questions in the audience? Uh, <laughs> yes, we see the first hand, please. Okay, if I may, but Latvians, you should also ask questions. My, my question concerns, uh, uh, well, legal issues related to, to dementia. It was mentioned by Piret, I think. Um, 
Uh, I mean, d dementia is, I understand that, that uh, um, thank you all, I should say also for all presentations that really give hope that there, there are ways to, to prevent and, and deal with dementia. But uh, a dilemma, it seems to me, uh, uh, with uh, uh, dementia is that the people that get this diagnosis, they don't always, well, they are not aware of, of uh, 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 the, their diagnosis. Uh, and in our societies, we, we are uh, uh, quite, I mean, we, we think it's important with the individual rights and, and so forth, and nothing should be, done, should be done without the consent of the patient. But, but uh, uh, it would be interesting if, if, if speakers could comment on this, because uh, uh, as I've well, had my experience, uh, it, it becomes a problem uh, when the, the, the person that actually needs uh, um, the help uh, may not want it. And, and this, this, these legal issues on whom should take the decisions, I mean, are there situations where someone else should and must take decisions on, uh, uh, on uh, care uh, uh, for people with dementia? So if, if someone of the speakers could comment on, on how the discussion goes in, in this area, it would be interesting. Thank you. Yeah, please, Pia. Thank you. I agree. That is a very difficult question. Um, in Finland, for example, we don't have a law on self-determination currently. And what we hear very often from the uh, social workers, for example, is that they see a person with need of some sort of assistance and services, but the person her or himself does not recognize the need. And basically, we cannot force anything. Um, I also realize there are a couple of questions concerning my presentation. But do you want me to answer them later um, or now? Maybe now we can give a floor to the online questions a bit later. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then uh, yeah. first Thank let's uh, have it from the audience. Uh, maybe some other comment on this question from other Pia or Piret. You want as well add something? No. No. Did you get the answer? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, other question, please. Would your time? What are they um, do we see? Yes, please, the hand. Um, we have some questions on Slido. And the first question is, uh, are geriatric, uh, sorry, are ger geriatric care centers part of social services or part of health care services? Uh, is it part of your question, probably? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the geriatric knowledge centers, they are part of healthcare services. It is an outpatient clinic, and basically, it's, it's a mixture of primary healthcare and specialist healthcare currently in most of the cases. So the geriatric doctors, they come from the specialized healthcare, but the nurses, memory nurses, physicians or occupational therapists, uh, nutritionists, they work for the primary healthcare. So it's a bit mixed system, but it's all healthcare system. But um, in, for example, in neurology, there might be also social workers working there because there are persons with need of social um, issues as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some other questions? Do we have in Slido platform? Yes, the second question is, is the Finnish Memory Pathway a geriatric knowledge centers, contact people, memory nurses, etc. already implemented and working or only a strategy as for now? Thank you, that's also a very good question. Um, the, we have um, well-being services counties, 22 of them currently, and they are all in a bit different stages. Some of them have been working for some time already, um, so that they have sort of their system, they have the pathway and, and agreed cooperation, referral systems and so on. Um, and in some areas it could be that they have, uh, for example, memory nurses, um, but they might work in different uh, sectors or different uh, establishments. And what we have in all of the country, but um, separately in, in all these counties, is client counseling system. 
So um, when I said that more often the first point of contact is um, client counseling, that is, for example, a telephone or e-contact that somebody can call and ask whether I can or my um, close one can have a memory assessment. So that's like one phone call and they will tell you where to contact and how to proceed. Um, so some parts of the pathway function in some areas and some areas may have the whole um, pathway created already. So it varies very much. Thank you. Um, and one more question or two more questions. Uh, specialized services for elderly with dementia can require you to move to care institutions or other living place. It can be very frustrating. How do you solve this dilemma? Is this question to whom? I <laughs> it doesn't say. Yeah. So, Piret once or, or Pia? Sophia, you again are ready to answer the question. That, that is a very difficult question. Um, so does it mean that it is difficult to, for example, move from home to an institution or from institution to another place? I guess that it's from home to it's, institution. It's, it's popular, it's been oh, yes, please. <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I was, but I was going to say that PIA is a good thing. The other is that you have to please put your headphones on and you will hear the translation. I was going to say that it's a good thing. Yeah, it depends on what is in Latvia, which is a good thing, 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 which is a good thing. Un tad ir ļoti acīm redzam, un tad faktiski ar šo cilvēku, kas ir demencē, ar viņu ir grūti runāt, nu arī Stefans minēja to piemēru, bet tā ir diezgan tipiska situācija, kā risināt šo problēmu, to dilemu, jo no viens puses neviens tuvinieks jau negrib ielikt pret personas gribu aprūpas institūcijā vai varbūt kaut kur citur, Jā, kā, ja, ja tāda vieta būtu, bet no otras puses nav arī daudz variantu. Varbūt ir kaut kāda ieteikuma prevencē, es nezinu, sagatavoties, mums bija piemēra par konsultācijas centru, jo Latvijā tāda konsultācijas centra nav. Nu, droši vien jūs tam esam gājuši cauri. Paldies. Paldies par jūs jautājumu. So, first, Pia and second yes. other Pia, please answer the question. Yes, indeed, very difficult questions. Um, we also have this problem of late diagnosis. Often it has proceeded very far. And as Stefan said earlier, that these persons, they don't necessarily recognize themselves that they are ill and they need help. Um, of course, um, we emphasize home care and living at home for as long as possible. But then it could be that there is a phase when it's just unavoidable, you have to move the um, care home. Um, there, currently, there are different types of care homes. There are those that do not function 24-7, but you can move into a care home before you have problems that need 24-7 care. So that might be one step, like you can enter earlier um, to care. But then if you need also um, more care, then, then you go to 24-7 uh, residential care. I don't know if I can say that we have solved this problem, but we try to create um, variation in the types of care facilities, like collective um, or communal care, where um, people can move earlier on and they can get social activities and things like that, when they still function rather well. And then there will be an option for more care when needed. But of course, we emphasize home care and staying at home and also support for informal carers at home as long as possible. But I don't know if there is a solution when there is a stage that you have to move it's maybe the best for the person just to move. 
it, sometimes it is very long, and sometimes it's different, difficult to draw the line when to react. It's very delicate, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, Pia, you want to add as well something, because it was also a question to you. <clears throat> well, I, I would just like to add to this that um, uh, I think that this is a topic within uh, the Nordic Dementia Network, that this is why uh, the Nordics really want to push uh, the diagnosis to such an early point as possible, because then you can be part of your own planning your uh, own journey because you know that it, it is just worsening but then you can be a part of that and that's all that is also relief for relatives and decision makers later uh, in 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 the journey I'm sorry to admit but probably there is also a problem when person in that early stage maybe wants to just decline that no it's not my diagno diagnosis so that's why he or she is very aggressive in cooperation and don't want to even take part in it and do you have any solutions or or I don't know advice in this please Piret. No, I just wanted to answer the question here we in Estonia we also suffer with the problem of um, late diagnosis and the image of the person with dementia being like in the last stages uh, not in the early stages like the image in the public eye um, but um, and of course uh, family members would like to keep uh, their loved ones at home for as long as possible but uh, there comes a day when this is not possible and and um, uh, the line is actually where it is not safe anymore um, and and what we tell the families is that sometimes the most loving action is to actually help uh, your loved one into a safe environment where they can get assistance and surveillance 24 7 which is at one point not not anymore possible in a home environment because we have had cases where the family caregivers we have been sending to, hosp to a hospital, also psychiatric hospital, before uh, the dementia patient gets help because they just, um, they just um, um, don't think about themselves. So sometimes they need the, the voice of reason that actually you have a, a life ahead of you and you start need to start thinking about yourself also and they need too much attention for you to manage it and this is the love thank you for your answer mm -hmm. yes i see raising hand there at the end as well please uh, please watch, switch on the microphone yeah. Ja es pareizi saprotu, bet ja cilvēks ne, ar demenci, viņam jau vajag 24 septiņi, bet viņš noliedz, kad viņš nevēlās iet šo aprūpas centru. Kā juridiski tas tiek risināts ar ģimeni vai nu, ab, minētās valstīs gan Somijā, gan Igaunijā? Viņam vajag šo 24 aprūpa, bet cilvēks pats viņš nevēlas iet uz institūciju. Paldies, Paldies. lai jūs jautājumu. to answer this um, well sometimes there may be cases when when you just need to take the person there um, I'm I'm not a legislator or I, I don't know the law that well and as I said we don't have the self-determination act yet mm. But as Piret said, sometimes it's loving that you can just let your loved one go to the um, care. And of course, there are those places, 24-7 care places, where the doors are locked. So basically, you cannot exit. Um, it's not good, it's not nice for the person 
but it could be safer for them. It could be cared. Yes, but I understood that the point is that the person doesn't want and is refusing, and that's why is there some legal way how to push, let it say, like it's like, or you're responsible for the person, so uh, is it some kind of legal framework where it says how to deal with these situations? No. We don't have a legal frame for, work oh. for this. Okay, no. thank you. Some comment also, Piret, you want to add? No, well, if it's the guardianship uh, issue, then of course you can, uh, the family member can, can make the decision. Um, sometimes um, you just you just don't say it the way that we are moving you <laughs> uh, permanently to a care home but it's the way you address it and 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 then you just take it as it goes mm -hmm. and it's mostly uh, it it's not necessarily that tragic how it ends up <laughs> they they fight it but then uh, they might also like it. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, you have it. And in Finland, it's also a medical doctor's decision. Mm -hmm. So he or she can make a decision that this person is not um, able to decide for him or herself. So maybe that is how it happens usually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so last questions, yeah, please. Yes, one last question from Slido. What is the waiting time for the individual counselling at the Estonian Dementia Competence Centre? Are four employees enough to respond to inquiries from all the country? At the moment, yes, it's enough, but <laughs> we work a lot. Um, well, I, I think it's uh, uh, not more than a week. I, I probably less and we can make an appointment yes mm. yeah there is a very short question because we need already to switch to coffee break and then come up with another uh, question is it short questions you want to add please yeah paldies man rīs jautājums abām valstīm gan igaunijai gan somijai vai ir jums pakalpojums aprūp mājās 24 septiņi Tad, kad cilvēks dzīvo savā dzīves vietā un var saņemt šo aprūpi ar demenci mājās. Paldies! Uh, not 24-7, no. Care well, services, yes, but uh, not as much as a <coughs> dementia per, uh, patient would need uh, towards the final stages. And in Finland, we have a system that you can have um, uh, home care visits um, during the 24 hours, but not 24-7 as such. So it's possible that somebody comes at night, for example, as well. Okay, thank you so much. Drīkst vienu īsu piebildi. Rīgā mums arī ir šāds pakalpojums 24 stundas pieejama aprūpe. Bet, protams, ne jau 24 stundu uzraudzība, bet tā ir paplašanātā, ja mūs mēs viņi saucam aprūpētās dzīvesvietas pakalpojums. Nu, protams, tas šobrīd rindas uz viņu nav. Thank you. Paldies par komentāru. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have now time for coffee break and networking opportunities here outside the audience. Uh, please come back after 20 minutes or 25 minutes and we will continue with the second part about support services for families and employees. Thank you. <laughs>